Dios te bendiga. Good morning, church. How are we doing today? Good, good. Happy to be here with you. Uh, my name is Josue. I'm one of the pastors here. My name is Christian Church. If we haven't met, uh, two things you know about me. I love Jesus and I love my wife. And if you spend any time around me, you'll hear me talking about one or the other. That's who I am. I love Christ and I love my wife, Nerissa. And I'm happy to be here as we open up the word of the Lord together. Uh, I don't know how much you guys keep up with the news or headlines, but let me just give you a few from this past week. Uh, here locally, former Indianapolis Colts player Daniel Muir was arrested. Uh, IMPD responds to a large gathering of juveniles downtown the 4th of July. Uh, three taken to hospital after separate early morning shootings around Indianapolis. Uh, nationally, Louisiana mandates stir debate about the Ten Commandments and their purpose. Maybe you heard that controversy. The Supreme Court says that cities can now punish people for sleeping in public spaces. Uh, Democrats urge Biden campaign to shift course after debate disaster. Uh, what about in the world? Uh, hur a hurricane barrel grows to category five strength in the Southeast Caribbean. Aid workers in Gaza are working for survival too. At least 750,000 on the brink of death and starvation in Sudan. Lord have mercy, Christ have mercy, Lord have mercy. Man, the list goes on and on. The subject we're talking about today is worry. Worry or stress or anxiousness, anxiety, worry. Worry is this feeling, right? This experience that many of us have. It's like a universal one. We can all point to th different things in our life, moments in our life where we've experienced anxiousness or anxiety or worry. You were probably even, uh, some of you may have been worried coming in this morning before I even read off different uh, news articles to you. Coming in or even listening online, worries that you have in your life, different experience, uh, experiences that you have going on right now that are just causing stress in your life. One of my favorite movies is Inside Out. And I was really happy to hear that the second one had come out. Anyone ever, everyone seen the second Inside Out yet? Beautiful movie, beautiful movie. I really liked it. Uh, if you're unfamiliar with the series, Inside Out talks about kind of your emotions and how they develop in a child. Uh, but they're, they're Pixar movies, so they're for little kids. Uh, but I really like them. And, and yeah, exactly. So I watched Inside Out 2, and I really appreciated the way that they portrayed anxiety. And uh, in the movie, they portray anxiety as this kind of over-encompassing force that can even be debilitating at times. Worry, stress, anxiety. Is there any remedy for our worry? Is there any hope for our stresses? Or in the words of the prophet Jeremiah, is there a balm in Gilead? Well, brothers and sisters, hermanos y hermanas, I wouldn't be here if there wasn't a hope. If the answer to that question was no. If you want to find the remedy for worry, would you open up your Bibles to the book of Matthew, the Gospel of Matthew, chapter 6. Uh, si tienen sus Biblias, por favor, ábrenlo al libro de Mateo, capítulo 6, empezando en versículo 25. We're going to be starting in verse 25 in the Gospel of Matthew, chapter 6. If you have your Bibles, I'll give you some time to open up. And it'll also be on the screen, uh, or you can use your devices as well. Uh, and if you haven't been here for a while, or if this is your first time, we're going through the Sermon on the Mount, a sermon series that we're calling Summer on the Mount, and we're looking at Jesus' famous teachings in Matthew chapter 5, 6, and 7, where Jesus just kind of lays out what it means to live the good life. If you're a teacher, then here is where you find your philosophy of teaching, here in Matthew 5, 6, and 7. If you're a nurse, here is where you find how to best love and care for your patients. If you're in law enforcement, here is where you discover what justice is, or better yet, who justice is. If you're a librarian, an accountant, a salesperson, a housekeeper, a mom or dad, married or single, here in Matthew chapter 5, 6, and 7, Jesus lays out what kind of life we are to live. And I just think that's exciting. 
I think it's exciting that here, regardless of what walk of life we come from, Jesus speaks uh, to the type of life we are to lead, that we are to follow after him and his teaching, that if we wanna live a life equipped for mission, then here in the Beatitudes, on the Sermon on the Mount is where we find our way, and the way, as we know, is Jesus Christ. And so, uh, without further ado, let me uh, read our text today from Matthew chapter 6, 25 to 34. Uh, this is the word of the Lord. Matthew 5, 6, 25 to 34, Jesus says, that is why I tell you not to worry about everyday life, whether you have enough food or drink or clothes to wear. Isn't life more than food and your body more than clothes? Look at the birds. They don't plant or harvest or store food in barns for your heavenly Father feeds them. And aren't you far more valuable to him than they are? Can all of your worries add a single moment to your life? And why worry about clothing? Look at the lilies of the field and how they grow. They don't work or make their clothing. Yet Solomon, in all of his splendor and glory, was not clothed as beautifully as they are. And if God cares so wonderfully for wildflowers that are here today and thrown into the fire tomorrow, he will certainly care for you. Why do you have so little faith? So don't worry about these things saying, what will we eat? What will we drink? What will we wear? These things dominate the thoughts of unbelievers, but your heavenly Father already knows all your needs. Seek the kingdom of God above all else and live righteously and he will give you everything you need. So don't worry about tomorrow, for tomorrow will bring its own worries. Today's trouble is enough for today. Lord, we thank you for this morning. Uh, we thank you for your word and your grace. Uh, thank you, God, and here in your word in Matthew chapter 6, God, you remind us that, man, there's a lot of concerns in the world. A lot of concerns that people in our room are carrying right now. But God, you tell us not to worry. May we hold fast to your word. And Lord, know that you can do more than we can ever ask or imagine. May you rest our hearts right now and learn to trust you, Father, you who takes care of the birds and the lilies in the field. In Jesus' name, amen. Uh, in reading scripture, it's always important to keep uh, the, the word in context, right? A phrase that's helpful when reading scripture is context is king. Context is King. When we're reading scripture, it's always important to keep it in context, to read it in light of what is in front of it, read it in light of what comes after it, because when you don't do that, that's when things start to go south. That's when you start to have really bad interpretations. And so, uh, gratefully, Pastor Ryan last week preached on the text right before this, where Jesus talks about storing our treasures in heaven and how we cannot serve two masters. Because if we serve one, uh, then we'll love one and we'll despise the other. And Jesus talks about how we should store our treasures in heaven where, 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 raw, where moth and rust won't eat and destroy. And it's this question of devotion that I want to focus on today, that we can't serve two masters. It's this question of allegiance. What I want to propose to you today is that worry abounds when we fix our lives, when we fix our gaze on the kingdom of this world, on the things below, as opposed to the things above, to the kingdom of God. La preocupación abunda en nuestra vida cuando nuestra mirada está puesta en los reinos de este mundo, en las cosas de abajo y no en las cosas de arriba, en el reino, en el reino de Dios. Let me unpack that for, for you this morning. I know it might sound a little bit simplistic. Because so really, is that the remedy for my worry? You don't know what's going on in my life. And Matthew uh, 6.25 says, that's, what, that's why I tell you not to worry about everyday life. Whether you have enough food or drink or clothes to wear, isn't life more than food and your body more than clothing? 
In Jesus' day, this is how they lived, right? They didn't have the luxuries of, let's say, a refrigerator or a microwave that lets, lets you heat up food in a moment's notice. And these are things that they struggled with every day, and it's uh, a way that much of the world still lives today, right? We were talking to some of our missionaries in El Salvador, and they were mentioning that uh, in their communities that they serve and that they work in, they have families who... They just go out each day to get what they need. They have a few dollars to spend, and so they go out to the market, and uh, they get enough just for that day. They get seasonings like mustard packets to season their food just enough for that day because they can't afford more, and if they were to buy more, they have nowhere else to store it. And similarly, with refugees and immigrants that come into our country here, like from Sudan or Somalia or Haiti, who are living in apartments with five, six, seven people who struggle to get doctor's appointments, struggle to find work, and the money they do have, they send it back home and they live off of what is left. Jesus here is addressing basic needs of our human life, eating, health, and clothing. Now, I don't want to miss the fact that there are people in here as well who do struggle with things like food insecurity or maybe a clothes, an abundance of clothes, especially in the winter seasons. We have people in here who are struggling with daily needs, even health, especially. Uh, maybe it's an illness that is truly worrisome. And Jesus is not ob oblivious to that. He is discussing things that are real in our lives, things that would have been on their minds each day. However, for the majority of us in here, uh, we don't have to worry about where our next meal is coming from. We don't have to worry about what we're going to wear the next day. Why? Because we are uh, affluent enough, we're wealthy enough to not have that concern occupy our minds. Instead, we have other worries that stress our minds. Worries such as finances, right? Am I going to have enough to cover the bills this week? Or responsibilities at work. Am I going to be able to reach the deadline at work? Or maybe you lost someone recently. Am I going to be able to move forward? Am I going to be able to continue on with my life in light of this person that I just lost? Maybe it's your safety that makes you fear. Maybe it's giving up driving in your old age that stresses you out. Maybe it's having family in another country. We all have things that crowd our minds, that occupy our thoughts, and Jesus is not oblivious to this. Jesus addresses this by mentioning things that are basic to our existence. How does Jesus reassure his listeners, though? Does he tell them, hey, just, just don't worry. That's it, just don't worry. Well, we all know that doesn't work, right? When you tell someone not to do something, the first thing that they do is exactly the thing you told them not to. If I tell you not to worry, you start to think about everything you got on your mind. I sometimes mess this up as a husband. I try to be a really good husband, and I see Narissa stressed out about something, and I'm like, maybe she wants to talk about what she's stressed out about. And so I'm like, hey, you want to talk about this? And she's like, no. Why? Because if she starts talking about it, she's going to be even more stressed. Thank God that Jesus' solution is a little bit more robust than that. It's a little bit more grounded. Jesus' solution is to tell his disciples to fix their eyes on the Father and to dedicate their lives to the kingdom. La solución de Jesús es decirles a los discípulos que se tengan los ojos puestos en el Padre y que se dediquen su vida a su reino. What does Jesus say in verse 26? He says, look at the birds. They don't plant or harvest or store food in barns, for your heavenly Father feeds them. And aren't you far more valuable to him than they are? Jesus not only tells them to change their point of view, to change their perspective, he tells them to physically do it. He says, hey, stop for a second. I know you're occupied, your mind's occupied with all these different things, but I need you to turn your gaze to the flowers of the field, to the birds of the sky and the food that they have and the nest full of little birds that they have. If I care for them, know certainly that I care for you. Jesus reminds his listeners of their value, that the God most high, the God of the universe is the one who breathes life into everything and that he cares deeply about you. He knows your name. He knows the things that you love and the things that you hate. He knows that you love Chinese food and that you hate when you hit a pothole after pothole. That's just me. Never mind. But he loves. He, he loves you. He knows you. He knows the things that stress you out. He knows the things that bring you peace. God intimately knows you. And he's reminding his people that he is the sustainer, the provider of everything. 
and he deeply cares for you. I had a mentor in college. Uh, he was a missionary in Latin America for a number of years, and then he, uh, him and his wife and his family went back to Joplin to live. And he was uh, uh, someone that helped me understand the voice of the Lord in my life. And one day, we were sitting at a table at a coffee shop together, and he tells me uh, that he's a recovering alcoholic and that it's become, a, uh, it's become an issue in his marriage recently. And he's sitting across the table from me, 50-year-old man, and he says, man, after years of telling Jesus, uh, telling people about Jesus and his love for them, I'm just now beginning to realize it for myself. I'm just now beginning to realize it for myself. And I wonder if here in our text today, Jesus wants to remind someone today, regardless of what age you are, that he deeply loves you, deeply cares for you. It's here in our acknowledgement where we aren't able to save ourselves, we aren't able to fix ourselves or even help ourselves, that we should run to the Father and say, God, help me. I know that you are the one who holds everything, but would you meet me here in this moment? What we do in our moments of worry is to fix our eyes on Christ and to seek him for our help. A life where we do not worry about what we eat or drink. I think that what Jesus is talking about here in Matthew chapter 6, verse 25 to 34, maybe you can call me crazy, but I think he's actually being serious. I think Jesus is being serious when he says, you can live a life without worry. I don't think he's being hyperbolic. I think we can take Jesus at his word. By the power of his spirit, we can have the strength to truly live this way. I find it interesting that in a different gospel, in the gospel of Mark chapter four, we receive a parable or a story about a person who goes out to a field to sow seeds. And they sow seeds in the field, and for one reason or another, the seed doesn't grow. Whether it's because the sun scorches the plant, or birds come and eat the plant. But listen to what Jesus says in Mark chapter 4, verse 19. Mark chapter 4, verse 19. Let me open up really quick. Jesus says, what does he say? Verse 18, that's what it was, verse 18. Uh, the seed that fell among the thorns represents others who hear the good, uh, the good news, God's word, but all too quickly the message is crowded out by the worries of this life, the lure of wealth and the desire of other things so no fruit is produced. Do you hear in the text what it is that chokes out the word of God. Can someone tell me this morning what it was in the text? One more time. Worry. God does not take lightly to our worry. And it could very well be that it's our worry that's crowding out the voice of God in our life and hindering us from hearing what God might be speaking to us. However, I do want to mention that what I'm discussing here are the stresses of everyday life the things that crowd our minds more than they should. What I'm not talking about is maybe someone uh, with like an anxiety disorder. If that's you this morning, don't hear me casting judgment on you. Uh, if that's you, maybe you should seek some medical help. And I do encourage praying, but that's not who I am speaking to. I'm speaking to most of us in here who have stresses in our life that we just allow to occupy our lives more than we should. So don't hear me casting judgment on you uh, this morning, but mainly, learning to trust in the Lord. In verse 27, Jesus says, can all of your worries add a single moment to your life? He says, hey, it's not really beneficial for you to worry in the first place. Actually, the more you worry, it's likely that your life will probably be shorter. So why do it in the first place? Let me speak to someone in here today. Maybe you're someone who just likes to always be on the go. You're going, you're going, you're going. You like to have eight plates spinning at once. You're always moving from one thing to another and from one worrier to another. For the love of Christ, for the love of your family, take something off your plate. All the things you have going on in your life is ruining your marriage, ruining your life, 
taken away time from your family? Do you see the birds in the sky and the lilies in the field? God cares for them and he wants to care for you, but he can't do that if you don't make space in your life for him. You're just not that important. We're not that important. From dust we came into dust we will return. I don't mean to be mean. I just want to be realistic and somewhat relieving that God can go on without us. But he chooses to participate with us. But he calls us not to worry. For his yoke is easy and his burden is light. So we must fix our eyes on Jesus. You might be saying, man, Josue, I hear you. Uh, That all sounds really helpful, but you don't really know what I got going on in my life. You don't know what I got going on in my life. It's fixing my eyes on Jesus really gonna help. I think it does, but let me continue on with the second part of our message that we also need to dedicate our lives to his kingdom. Look at what Jesus says in Matthew chapter six, verse 32. He says, these things dominate the thoughts of unbelievers. These things dominate the thoughts of unbelievers, but your heavenly father already knows all your needs. Seek the kingdom of God above all else and he will give you everything you need. Recently, the Lord blessed Nurse and I with a home and uh, now we're happy residents of Hallville. Uh, We had a housewarming party recently and we were grateful for many of our elders and pastors and friends who were able to come. However, I must say, that was probably the most amount of white folk our block has ever seen. But, uh, but we are grateful for our brothers and sisters. And Norris and I prayed and sought counsel before moving into this community, and we knew that it would come with some adjustment. The biggest adjustment for me has been the lack of safety. The gunshots in the night have become like church bells for me, reminding me to pray for whoever may be on the receiving end of a barrel and for the person who deemed it necessary to shoot in the first place. I've had to learn a practice recently, and that has been to trust God as my refuge in the night, as my help in times of trouble. Uh, I heard a song recently that said that God will lead you to the safest places. I'm sorry, but I just don't believe that's true. Following Jesus always requires a cross. Following Jesus always requires a crucifixion. There is no following Jesus without a cross. This is who he calls us to be. This is how he calls us to live. And he says, foxes have holes, birds have nests, but the son of man has nowhere to lay his head. Jesus says that those who put their hands to the plow and look back are not fit for the kingdom of God. That those who leave mother, brothers, sisters, property, or anything for my kingdom and who are persecuted for me will receive a hundredfold in the, time, in the life to come. Now, not too long ago, Pastor Ryan said that the gospel you preach is the disciple you make. And let it be known, brothers and sisters, that this is the gospel we preach, that we might fix our eyes on God, that we might dedicate our lives to his kingdom, and he will give us everything we need. Amen? The Father will provide all that we need. The remedy for our worry is to fix our eyes on Christ and to seek his kingdom. El remedio para nuestra preocupación es tener los ojos puesto en Cristo y en su reino. Don't miss what Jesus is saying here. Anytime you read in the Gospels the word kingdom, you should be taken back a little bit. Why? Because the king, when Jesus says the word kingdom, it's not just a word you throw around in the first century unless you want to be killed. I mean, Jesus is in the Roman Empire and they do not tolerate uprisings or people who try to usurp power. Kingdom is very much a political term. Julius Caesar in 42 BC was recognized as the divine Julius. And August, uh, Augustus in 27 BC was recognized as uh, the divine son of Caesar or son of God. These terms sound familiar. They're used for Jesus. Jesus is not being subversive or covert. He is being explicit. When Jesus says that the kingdom of God is at hand, those are fighting words, which is no surprise why he is later killed. Frederick Bruner puts it this way. 
He says, being a disciple has always required Christians to be cultural atheists, publicly disavowing the myriad of gods of popular life. To be a Christ follower, Jesus says, is to seek his kingdom and to have our allegiance on him above all else. Let me just say that one more time. We just celebrated Independence Day. We have an election coming up that our allegiance 100% needs to lie in Christ Jesus. You cannot serve two masters, Christ says, for you will love the one and you will despise the other. We must not give our attention to the same thing as those who are unbelievers do. We must not speak in the same way, do the same things, but we must live as kingdom people, people of the way, gente del camino. It's fascinating that those who seem to put Jesus' words in practice the most in terms of not worrying are those who are willing to give their life for him. Listen to these accounts and hear the lack of worry in their testimonies. March 10th, 1990, uh, Archbishop Oscar Romero during the Civil War of El Salvador, he says this. He says, I've frequently been threatened with death. I must say that as a Christian, I do not believe in death, but in the resurrection. If they kill me, I will rise again in the people of El Salvador. I am not boasting. I say it with the greatest humility. As a pastor, I am bound by a divine command to give my life for those who I love. And that includes all Salvadorans, even those who are going to kill me. If they manage to carry out their threats, I shall be offering my blood for the redemption and resurrection of El Salvador. Martyrdom is a gift from God that I do not believe I have earned. But if God accepts the sacrifice of my life, then my blood, then may my blood be the seed of liberty, a sign of hope that will soon become a reality. May my death, if it is accepted by God, be for the liberation of my people and a witness of hope with what is to come. You can tell them, if they succeed in killing me, that I pardon them, and I bless who may carry out the killing. But I wish that they could realize that they are wasting their time. A bishop will die, but the church of God, the people, will never die. Oscar Romero goes on to die two weeks later. April 3rd, 1968, Martin Luther King Jr. Uh, well, I don't know what will happen now, but we, we, we've got some difficult days ahead, but it really doesn't matter with me now because I've been to the mountaintop and I don't mind. Like anybody, I would like to live a long life. Longevity has its place, but I'm not concerned about that now. I just want to do God's will. He's allowed me to go up to the mountain, and I've looked over, and I've seen the promised land. I may not get there with you, but I want you to know tonight that we as a people will get to the promised land. And he goes on to die on April 4th, 1968, the next day. Uh, April 8th, 1945, Dietrich Bonhoeffer, on the day of his of his, uh, of his death, he says, this is the end for me, the beginning of life. March 7th, 203, St. Perpetua, on the date of her death, she says, stand fast in the faith and love one another, all of you, and be not offended at my sufferings. 160 AD, St. Polycarp, the Bishop of Smyrna, says, the proconsul said to Polycarp on the day of his death, take an oath, I will let you go, just revile Christ. Polycarp answered, 86 years I have served him and he has done me no wrong. How can I blaspheme my king and my savior? 36 AD, the apostle Stephen in Acts chapter seven, verse 59, while they were stoning him, Stephen prayed, Lord Jesus, receive my spirit. Then he fell asleep on his knees and cried out, Lord, do not hold this sin against him. When he said this, he fell asleep. These are people, brothers and sisters, who have embodied the words of Christ to its full extent. People who have dedicated their lives to Christ and his kingdom, who understand that following King Jesus doesn't mean, well, they're gonna live a life that is convenient, live a life that is comfortable. But man, when we seek Christ and his kingdom, he will provide everything that we need. Maybe not in this lifetime, but certainly in the one to come. What I'm not telling you this morning is to go get martyred. Just as Oscar Romero says, he says that, that martyrdom is a gift, not something that we go out and seek. However, what I am telling you today 
is to seek first the kingdom of God and everything else will be added to you. From my reading of scriptures, it seems that the solution to worry is to trust God and everything in our life, to submit to him and trust that he will provide. I guess it's also worth mentioning that one of the things that I do for worry in my life uh, is pray, is fast, and go to counseling. Counseling has been a, a great benefit to me recently. Uh, Pete Scazzaro in his book, Emotionally Healthy Spirituality, says that you cannot be spiritually mature if you are emotionally immature. And I think he's true. Many of us live with lies and wounds that we have yet to heal from. And Christ Jesus wants to come in our lives. It could be that some of our worry is from pain that we have yet to heal from. I want to ask you a question this morning. Jesus says to seek first the kingdom of God above all else. When you're worried, what is it that you seek first? When you're worried, what is your balm? What is your remedy? Is it food? Is it sleep? Is it video games? Is it social media? Is it pornography? Is it work? All these things are usually byproducts of an unmet social, uh, emotional need that you might have. You might think that that might be the problem, but really there's something deep down that you need to get figured out. And Christ welcomes us into that, and only he can aid us in this, uh, in this struggle, in this wrestle, in this fight that we have of becoming more conformed into the image of Christ. And so if you're someone in here who has never accepted Jesus, I wanna invite you to do that today. I'll be in the lobby if you wanna have a conversation about that. Maybe you're in here and you're saying, man, I got stress. I've tried every other method, but I'm still worried. Christ Jesus says his yoke is easy and his burden is light. And that when we walk with him, we can live a life of no worry. Here's how I wanna end our message today. If you would close your eyes, I wanna read this text over you one more time. In Matthew chapter six, verse 25 to 34, that is why I tell you not to worry about everyday life, whether you have enough food or drink or clothes to wear. Isn't life more than food and your body more than clothes? Consider the birds. They don't plant or harvest or store food in barns for your heavenly father feeds them. And aren't you far more valuable to him than they are? Can all of your worries add a single moment to your life? And why worry about your clothing? Consider the lilies of the field and how they grow. They don't work or make their clothing, yet Solomon in all of his glory was not clothed as beautifully as they are. And if God cares so wonderfully for wildflowers that are here today and thrown into the fire tomorrow, he will certainly care for you. Why do you have so little faith? So don't worry about these things saying, what will we eat? What will we drink? What will we wear? These things dominate the thoughts of unbelievers, but your heavenly father already knows all your needs. Seek the kingdom of God above all else and live righteously, and he will give you everything you need. So don't worry about tomorrow for tomorrow will bring its own worries. Today's trouble is enough for today.